And with that, let's meet our presenter, Dr. Dan Gron. Um, Dan has been working with tech since 2006, and he is a seasoned AI researcher, cybersecurity expert, and thankfully an instructor because he teaches with XLILT. Um, he spent over a decade working with the Department of Defense and the US intelligence community um, to deploy cutting edge AI intelligence applications. And his current research focuses on AI and cybersecurity, which is super important these days, very topical. So Dan doesn't just teach this stuff, he's living it, he's breathing it. Um, and he's won multiple awards for his publications on AI and responsible AI. Um, and this is all great, but what I think really makes him stand out is he, not only does he know this stuff, he's an excellent communicator. And if you're not really sure where to start with AI or ML for your organization, he's really good at pinpointing what you need and then guiding you to a curriculum. Um, and he is a sought after trainer, speaker, speaker, panelist. He develops and teaches a lot of our courses, including ethical and responsible AI, which he is very involved in. So I really couldn't think of a more perfect person to present. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, all right, so let me see. Without further ado, let me let me pass it on over, and um, we'll let Dr. Gron dazzle you with AI. Uh, let me just go ahead. Thank and you. Stop um, would you just confirm that you're able to see my screen? I want to make all sure. All right, I... let me just go ahead and stop share. Yes, um, I can see Practical Gen AI for Executive Slide. Fantastic. Awesome. Um, so I'm really excited to talk today. And as I prepared this, there are so many different avenues that you can go to explain generative AI, what's happening with the technology and how it's impacting the world today. Um, but one of the things that I fundamentally believe is that knowledge is the antidote to fear and uncertainty, and that if we take the time to look a little bit deeper at how some of this technology works, then it will give us practical skills to be able to think through the different applications, ethics, um, implications of the technology, not just in a, a kind of rote, do we check this checklist to make sure that we're applying something at or applying it within its bounds, but to get a real intuitive sense of what is happening with the technology and how it can be applied. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll beg your indulgence to go a little bit deeper than probably is often goes with an executive audience. But for the purpose of explaining this technology and really seeking to demystify it. So I'll begin with the question, what is intelligence? And intelligence comes from this Latin word, intellectus, which comes from the proto-Latin word intellego, which means to select between. And I love this definition because it implies that the core of intelligence is simply selecting between options. And I think that this is a, a good definition, um, intellect today um, is often conflated with understanding. Um, but if we boil it down to it, let's think about intelligence and AI as a selecting between options. So I demonstrate intelligence when I select which route to drive to go to the store, or I select which of the 50 brands of toothpaste to buy, or when I select what to watch on Netflix tonight. Now, if this is intelligence, then artificial intelligence is just going to be intelligence that is demonstrated by machines or not a intelligence which is inherent in the world around us. Now, AI works by learning from data. So in other words, there's a big set of information that is out there and is available. And we have algorithms that build up some representation of the patterns that are in the data so that it can use those patterns to make selections. There's a couple of different ways that AI can be trained. It can be trained in a supervised manner, which means that there are examples that the AI is learning from. These examples would be something like uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 2 plus 6 equals 8, where there's an input of the 2 plus and an output of that number. 
There's also something called unsupervised learning where there isn't that input and output, there's just data. And the model is able to learn the patterns in that. A great example recommendation engines saying, here's what you might want to watch, here's what you might want to buy, um, simply based upon the patterns that are already there. Um, and then reinforcement learning. You can think of this as an autonomous vehicle, and it's just when the AI is learning in an environment and the actions that it takes don't necessarily have an immediate right or wrong impact, but over time, there are better actions and worse actions. So on the right in this animation is something called linear regression. It's one of the simplest um, examples of AI, and it simply fits a line to a cluster of points. At this point, it's so AI has gotten so advanced, we don't even really think of linear regression as AI, but it does fit under that category of supervised learning. So what can AI do? Um, it can do things like assign input into classes. So spam, there was a uh, Charlie XCX uh, post, Kamala is brat. And suddenly everyone needed to know what the word brat meant in this context. Well, the embedding of the word brat there would already have captured that usage. That's not in the dictionary. You can't go look it up easily. Um, but because the LLMs have seen brat used in so many different ways, the embedding has it captured that aspect of brat being used in a positive way and not necessarily saying, oh, that kid is a brat. So these embeddings, even though they're just numbers, have an ability to represent the meaning of text. Now, this is incredibly important to the way LLMs work. And I want to pause for a minute thinking about these numbers and have you think about a good memory you have. Is that good memory just one singular moment, or rather is it a collection of small moments? So if I think about a good memory, I have, uh, let's say, visiting the Mackinac Bridge with my family. It's not that I have a memory of simply seeing it or having a memory of one snapshot with my family. It's kind of all of these different moments that went into that time period. A memory for us is very much like an embedding for a model. It helps understand the holistic context of these tokens. At the same time, my memory is faulty. When I think about things that have happened to me in the past, it is very possible for me to misremember them. And with these embeddings, because the model has seen so much, because it's been trained on so much text, it's very easy for the model to misremember these memories and to do what we call hallucinate. And so while there is this holistic understanding embedded into um, embedded into the embeddings, it isn't able to capture all the specifics. Just like humans can't capture all of the specifics in our brain, the models aren't going to be able to capture the, the, the specifics. It's more of the gestalt, that overall understanding. Now, one cool thing is that there is a direct connection between the embeddings that LLMs are learning and the fMRI scans that humans are learning. In fact, you can map them back and forth and say, hey, this word in, in an embedding space represents this pattern in a brain. And what that goes to say is that something more fundamental is happening. So there's a hype going around that Gen AI is currently sentient or conscious. I don't think it's there yet. It is possible that it gets there one day, and that's a whole conversation. But what it is, is a complex algorithm working on these embeddings. That said, Gen AI is not just fancy math. Something is happening with these learned structures that is revealing something fundamental about our reality. If our brains are learning and embedding in 
the chemicals and the pathways that is similar to what the LLMs are learning in these embeddings, even though we are two entirely separate organisms, then something we are converging on something which is more fundamental than simply the pattern of the brain. It might be a mathematical representation of our reality. And how cool is that? Um, so we have we have embeddings. We, we've taken in our text. We've converted it into identifiers. We've converted it to embeddings. And if we did math on these embeddings, we could analyze their semantic meaning and we pass it through the model, ignoring all of that math, and we simply predict the next token. And this is where the math gets complicated. In reality, we're not just predicting one token. There's a whole lot of tokens that there's a probability of, and we just select the next one almost at random, using some different strategies to bias the random towards more common tokens. So for instance, I have some input text here. Um, it's a beautiful day, don't let it get blank. And if I left it here and asked the model to predict the next token, it would give me these probabilities. 21% chance it's you, 19% chance it's two, 16 that it's in, six that it's any, six that it's two, and three and a half that it's away. Um, any of these could be a valid next word. Uh, it's, it's something that hu humans do. We start a sentence and we don't necessarily have the ending of the sentence in mind. We're kind of building it on the fly. And so this is sort of what the models are doing. They are starting a sentence. And if this model picked you as the next token, it doesn't know necessarily what the next five tokens are going to be, but it knows that you is a good next token or next word to say. And once we have this, we can keep predicting tokens. We can let it say away and continue the next word and the next word and the next word. And as it builds up these words, as it builds up these tokens, that is how we get the output of, uh, of an LLM, of ChatGPT. So that is this process. We're going from the input to the tokenization to the embedding to the prediction and back. And the core thing that I want you to understand here is that this is mathematics. It is not magic. It is not indistinguishable from magic. It is a very real process by which we are learning patterns in data and then reproducing those patterns in ways that are similar to our brain in some ways and in ways that are dissimilar in others. So if I look at what the full Gen AI architecture looks like, the model is actually a small component of it. Um, in this diagram, we have the model all the way over here on the right, and it's just a little bit of a component. So if I'm gonna go online and I'm gonna interact with ChatGPT or Gemini, I'm not putting my text directly into the model. What's happening is a whole bunch of steps before it and after it, which enable it to be better than just the model on its own. So there are some caches in here which just help to make sure they're not overusing the GPUs or overusing the system resources. But as myself, as a user enters text, there's gonna be a period for enhancement where there's an option to do things like a web search or look through documents and to provide those along with my request to the model in something called retrieval augmented generation. Um, you can think of that as a test with open notes. It's not just that I'm able to answer a user's question, the model's able to answer a user's question, but it's able to see some results from the internet or from a document alongside answering that question. And if you think about the embeddings, the embeddings alone might not contain enough information to answer every question out there. Like what is the population of Algeria in the year 1986? But if I'm able to look that up on the internet, look up maybe, you know, 
ask that question and find a, a database that includes populations for Algeria, and I can give it to the LLM alongside the question, then the LLM can select that number and give it to the user much more reliably than if it was just relying upon those embeddings, those memories of the things that it has learned in the past. There's also going to be some safety guardrails on the input and output to make sure that the model isn't doing things that are harmful or um, going to be a liability, whether security or ethics. And it does have some options to do some actions and to update models, on, update things on the output. So if, for instance, it could send a chat message via Slack just by hitting an API. So that's what the Gen AI architecture looks like. It is a model. It's generating text through that next token prediction. But then in totality, it's something beyond that. It is including the enhancement. It's, in, it's including the context around it. It's building in the safety and the guardrails. And if this is beginning to look a lot more like a complicated software architecture, um, that's because it is. Uh, there's a big hype that Gen AI is this easy button to add new features, to simply say, I, I will throw AI at it and it will solve all the problems. And while AI can do some really, really cool, amazing things, it does take some skill and training to be able to implement successfully because it is very much a new way of thinking about software and a new way of doing development. Now, speaking of that, speaking of implementing AI, there is a specific AI team. It's not the same as a software development team. It takes a little bit of uh, different skills. And over time, I'm sure that the roles and titles and responsibilities that I'm about to share will kind of be fo more formalized and set between companies. But for the time being, um, they do very widely. One company might call the role one thing. Another one might use another term. But here are roughly the four main roles in a AI team. There is a data engineer who is going to work with the data to make sure that it is accessible, that it has the right data, that there's no problems in the pipelines that are bringing the data from point A to point B. There's a data scientist who's going to work to turn the data into models. And if right here, when I refer to models, it's not just that they're building LLMs or building um, a traditional AI system, a predictive AI. It's that they're using the data to get to some output. So the LLM may already be available, but they're going to use that LLM to solve some problem. Then there's going to be an ML engineer that helps take the model that the data scientist has produced uh, to get their solution into production. And that's really useful because the ML engineer is going to have kind of the split of expertise between a traditional DevOps expert and a data scientist. So they have a bit more understanding about how these um, unique AI systems are working, but they also have the ability to know how to hook those up into the modern architectures that we use to serve applications. And lastly, to keep everyone in the executive and director role happy, there's a project manager who is going to smooth that coordination, uh, ensure there's a timely delivery. I do think that's very core to an AI team because you have such diverse people working on it. Now, how do we look at AI teams versus a traditional software team? So while a software team is going to be looking at specific functionalities, an AI team is likely going to be focused more on building intelligent models or building intelligent systems. So if a software team might say, implement an API to get access to a support ticket that someone logged, the AI team might be building a chatbot to share the status of the uh, issues with that 
that user and maybe to provide updates and context to it. Uh, now, certainly the AI team can de develop specific features that are using AI, um, but that is not necessarily their focus. In terms of skills, the software team is going to have software skills. While the AI team is going to have more of an understanding of AI, certainly statistics and algorithms, because these are at the core of what's happening, and you need to know statistics to be able to evaluate the output of these systems and to be able to calculate metrics which are meaningful to evaluating how well the models perform. In terms of development, we have done software development for a long time now. I have a Fortran book on my shelf back there that was published in 1964. And uh, I have actually used that uh, as a reference. It still works. I won't tell you where I had to look up Fortran uh, and use a book from 1964, but I did. On the other hand, we've only been doing kind of AI in production for a few decades, maybe. Uh, may, let's say two and really in earnest over the past couple of years. And so the development process is much more iterative. It's much more experimental. And it is going to be grounded in the data and results. So it's not necessarily that we're just hitting a requirement. The AI team is going to say, we need to get to this level of accuracy or this level of performance in order to consider the results a success. And when I say it's iterative, I mean that it, you're going to start with a baseline functionality. And that baseline functionality might not be great it might be accurate only 60% of the time. But from there, you can build and eventually have a model which is accurate 70% of the time or a system which works 80% of the time, 99 um, eventually, hopefully. And so that's what I mean by iterative. The deliverables are going to be different because your AI team is going to be delivering the algorithms and insights where software is going to be more about the applications. And the challenges around the AI team are going to be much more around the data quality, the bias of the model, um, very complex deployment, and especially if you are in a highly regulated environment or if you're working with high-risk models in the EU and subject to the EU AI Act, um, you're going to need to provide some explainability of these models. And you know what? Let me go ahead and pull up a uh, Google page, and I'm gonna just kind of, what is the EU AI Act? I'm gonna ask a question here, and we can see that there is a Google Search Labs. Um, you've probably seen this before, this is generative AI. If I look here, I can see show more, I can see generative AI is experimental, it's gonna tell me that generative AI is being used. If I click up to learn more, I can learn more about how AI is being used in this. If I click here, um, it's not pulling up right now, but typically that hamburger is going to show me. Um, oh, yeah, it's going to say I can give feedback. There's a source here. These results are not personalized. So one of the challenges of deploying AI is not just that explainability, but making sure that your users know how AI is being used and uh, to be transparent about its usage. So some hype and reality. The hype is that Gen AI can be implemented by anyone. And that is certainly true that you could implement it by anyone. But to really make sure that there's success, it's probably going to take upskilling some of your software teams to really make sure that the investments are good and worthwhile and to avoid some of the common pitfalls which can come with the implementation of AI. I want to talk briefly about the challenges of AI project management. Um, I think there's a lot of difference between AI project management and software project management, and it really does require a different way of thinking. Because with AI project management and Gen AI project management, data is critical. Uh, while software might be dependent upon the data, um, it's rarely the thing which is going to determine the success or failure. 
of the project. Um, when we talk about software, there can certainly be high complexity software, especially if you're looking at simulations. I used to do atmospheric simulations. Those are still some can be more complex than AI, AI models. Um, but the AI models are almost always going to be complex and unpredictable in some cases. Experimentation is going to be necessary. You're going to have requirements or, which are changing all the time. And one thing that's often not taken for granted is, or often ignored is that with AI systems, they're going to need to be upgraded. If you think about a software product, I'm sure all of us has intera have interacted with a software system that may be 10, 20 years old, and it's still chugging along. Sure, you might have to go turn on a Windows 2000 machine to use it, but it plays a core role in the business functionality and nobody's paid to replace it yet. So you just kind of put up for it, uh, put up with it and allow it to keep operating. Um, AI models don't quite have that dependability because as the data comes in, that data is ultimately tied to the real world. Um, and when I say the real world, I mean the human interaction, natural physical world, not the digital world. Um, and as, as the physical world goes on, the real world goes on, it changes. And so an AI model that is trained 10 years ago probably doesn't have language today or how certain words interact today because it, language has evolved over the past 10 years. Um, so they, models have to change consistently. Um, explainability can be incredibly challenged. One of the real big differences is evaluation and deployment. To be able to say, is my Gen AI working? And to use the appropriate metrics to measure that, to make sure that you're not just um, measuring accuracy, but making sure that when there are failures, those failures aren't significant enough to have a major impact. That sort of evaluation is not always, it's not running unit tests. It's not um, a regression testing. It's a complicated process of really making sure these models are going to work for the business purpose. One of the things that I love to do in the evaluation of models is to use a cost effectiveness ratio. So this is drawn from healthcare, which you just say, hey, here's our, you know, our support system that's just using the support from uh, a human's human interaction for tech support. And this is what it costs. This is what its value is. And then if we say, if we replace those humans with an AI system, what is going to be the cost difference? How much um, cheaper is it? And what's the value difference? So what's the difference in cost and benefit? And what's that trade-off? And being able to say, hey, it's might be more expensive to use the humans, but we can't afford the risk of the, or the decrease in quality that comes with the AI system right now. That's the kind of evaluation um, that you really have to do to understand it. Now, one of the hype, uh, Gen AI is just like an API, so it's just a software project. In reality, generative AI is experimental and requires time for research. Um, I like to say that AI is both research and development because you are going to need some time to just explore, to experiment, to do um, hypothesis testing. And if you don't build that time into the project and allow for it to work, um, if you just kind of assume this is software development, then you're really setting up the team for failure. There's just different approaches to managing research projects than there are development projects. And when they are coinciding and have to live together, it takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of careful balancing to make sure that you don't put too much emphasis on one or the other.
So all of this is is kind of laying the groundwork. Or we have Gen AI. We have understood a little bit about how it works. Know that it's not software. It's not a easy button to fix all of the problems that we're having. And I want to talk a little bit in this last few minutes here about ethics. So at its core, AI ethics is going to ensure that the use of AI technologies aligns with human values and benefits society as a whole. Really what I mean here is that we want to be proactive rather than reactionary. If you look at the history of technology, there are things in history like DDT that companies were built on. They were wildly successful on. But then as DDT made an ethical transition, it be, they suddenly lost a huge amount of revenue. They fell on the negative side of the public and uh, companies had to shut down over that. So making sure AI ethics to me is making sure that when we deploy AI, it's of a benefit to society. But more importantly, we're not deploying AI that in two years is going to be banned or is going to be so controversial that it has to pull back and is going to be a reputational harm. So the hype here is that AI ethics is just going to make sure that we don't uh, have some doomsday scenario and all the humans die at the hands of Skynet. In reality, AI ethics is practical, it serves business goals, and it makes sure that there is a solid return on investment and also hopefully stops AI from taking over the planet. Now to do that, we do have really practical tools. We have the NIST AI risk management framework. This has been adopted by the federal government. It has been adopted by the uh, Department of Defense it has been adopted by California. It's a wildly successful, even if early phases, framework to plan out AI risk. And it involves these functions. You set up some governance to make sure you have appropriate systems for AI risk management. You map out where your risks are. You measure them to make sure that you can say, here's a metric that defines my risk. And then you manage them, whether it's insurance, whether it's um, saying, I'm going to mitigate that risk. I'm going to avoid it entirely and do something else. Um, and what's really useful about the NIST AI risk management framework is that it's practical. It's broken down. If you go to your, their website, you can see what each of those phases is about and get actions about how to follow and implement them at different levels of fidelity. But more importantly, the AI RMF talks about the characteristics of trust, things that are necessary for us to have trust in AI systems. And most importantly, the systems are going to be reliable. They're going to work and they're going to be accurate. Um, they're going to be accountable and transparent, like what I showed on Google, where it said generative AI is experimental. It's, it's You can see that AI is being used. You don't want your AI to do things that are unsafe, whether it's to actively harm people or to break systems, kind of go rogue and use so much of your GPU that it catches fire. You want to make sure that the AI is secure, that it's not accessible to malicious users, that if there's an attack on it, that it's going to be resilient. You want to make sure that it's not leaking people's private information. And you want to make sure that any of the biases in the model are carefully managed so that you're not outputting um, discriminatory results based upon protected characteristics. All of these things are kind of characteristics of trust that aren't just true about, um, about AI, but are kind of true about companies in general and humans in general. You want your humans to be accurate. You want them to be transparent. You want them to be safe. Um, you want them to keep things private. And so sometimes I think of what does it take for me to trust a human? It's kind of the same thing that it's going to take for me to trust an AI system. Now, when it comes to generative AI, there are a unique set of risks. And the NIST AI risk management framework does provide a good list of those. 
there's the risk of making chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear information more accessible. Hopefully, it doesn't apply to many of us, and especially if we're using LLMs through APIs, then it's a much lower risk. Hallucination is a big one, what's called confabulation here. So this is just a confident assertion of truth when you have nothing to ground it on. Now, don't get me wrong. Humans are perfectly capable of hallucinating and just saying, this is what's accurate with absolutely no basis in reality. Um, but models do it too, and we need to make sure that we're not simply reliant on, on that. There's a risk of generating text that makes violent recommendations. A lot of these LLMs have at times recommended self-harm to users. Absolutely be a problem, making sure that data is safe. And if you have environmental goals as a business, consider how you're rolling out generative AI in a way that's environmentally friendly. It could be something as simple as, you know what, this um, this particular region in our cloud services we know has 100% renewable energy. So we're going to do all our Gen AI processing in this region or in this set of regions that's renewable energy, but having some way of thinking through the environmental aspects of it, incredibly useful. Um, information integrity is one that we think of in terms of misinformation and disinformation. Information security is like my uh, all-time favorite. It's making sure that we don't make hacking too easy for people with generative AI. Um, intellectual property is a huge one, and I would say at most of our levels, we're not going to have to worry about um, the kind of lawsuits that are coming out between OpenAI and the New York Times or something because they use the content. Really, the big concern is that right now, anything that's generated by AI does not have a copyright. Um, it is uncopyrightable. Um, so there is concerns that you might be reproducing intellectual property um, and that the output of the LLMs isn't intellectual property. Um, you always want to make sure that there is nothing obscene about the generative AI uses. Um, there's huge issues with both CSAM and NCII um, going around with Gen AI now. And then, as, as always, bias. And as you integrate Gen AI into your supply chain, making sure that it's transparent and it's not introducing risks that you are not aware of. I think this covers most of the Gen AI risks which are unique to Gen AI, and I could go into a lot more specifics, um, but it is kind of such a broad category that it really depends on your application which ones are applicable and which ones are not. So one of the hypes you're gonna see around Gen AI risks is that it takes an advanced degree in ethics to understand it, that you have to know all these things to make sure that you're not um, engaging in some form of bias and making sure that um, you're not producing harmful material. But in reality, we have tools that are helping us take steps towards effective AI ethics. And tools and training, that's really all you need to make sure that you are doing well at the AI ethics today. So I have one more hype and reality. Um, the hype is that generative AI will revolutionize everything. I don't think that's necessarily wrong. Um, but I'll say the reality is that AI, not necessarily generative AI, but all of artificial intelligence is already revolutionizing everything. And it has been since the at least the early 2000s. And the transformation that we see in the world around us with the Google Homes, with Siri, with ChatGPT, with the self-driving cars that are coming and are already here, all of these things are going to revolutionize the world, but it's not going to happen overnight. Just like electricity didn't get rolled out to every city and every home right away, just like indoor plumbing still isn't available to everyone in the world. And just like uh, any example in technology, we don't see these things rolled out overnight. It does take time, 
but we do see these technologies as revolutionary. So I would say if you feel behind as a business leader, if you're saying, oh, shoot, like our company is doing nothing with generative AI, we don't have a generative AI team, we don't know anything about responsible AI, that's okay. It's, it's not like the difference between now and three months ago or three months from now is going to be make or break when it comes to AI. From my perspective, I'm sure I could argue that around the edges, but get started. Build, a, build an AI team, build a generative AI team, get some training in responsible AI. I'd love to give it to you. Um, everything takes time. And the last few concluding thoughts, I don't think that generative AI is going to replace the creativity of humans. I have yet to see that spark of brilliance in AI art. Um, AI may augment human intelligence, but I do believe our intelligence is indispensable because we simply, we're better than the machines right now. And while there are great results of generative AI, people are becoming sensitive to its outputs. So I'd be careful about just sending out generative AI outputs without carefully vetting them. And as I already clicked through, it is spooky season. So uh, I went a little SNL there. Um, happy to take whatever questions you have about any of the topics that we covered today. Um, or anything that is on your mind about AI or generative AI. And feel free to either throw that in the chat. I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself, but I am watching the chat. Yep, I'm watching the chat too, Dan and... Um... Yeah, just go ahead, throw them in there. But may, maybe in the meantime, while we're getting some some questions, um, I can show some of our mm -hmm. courses, especially the ones that you've talked about. Um, so if you, oh, I think maybe just one came in. Top does below. not. Okay. Does not, Justin. Sorry, that was a typo on my part. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. Um, okay. Uh, so Dan, would it be all right if I just, if I took over yeah, the absolutely. shared real right quick? Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, one second. I feel a little strange, like being a disembodied voice here. There we go. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So I'm hoping that you can see, um, my screen for AI and generative AI training. Um, can you see that, Dan? Yep. Okay, awesome. Um, so just wanted to show you just as as Dan was talking about the different AI um, roles for developers, DevOps, data scientists, managers, end users. Um, so, you know, if you've got an organization that needs total upskilling, we can take every part or, you know, if you just have a team here and there, that's fine. getting them to the right place. Um, and I'm just gonna go down here to end users. We've got an introduction to generative AI course that is coming up. I'm gonna just go ahead and view details. Um, so this is available for private um, customized training, but we also have a public date here. October 14th, this is guaranteed to run. So if you just have one or two people to train, you might wanna go with uh, this public class and a lot of the courses um, have public dates associated with them too. So let me just go back and see any questions that, whoops, <laughs> let me just stop my share for a moment. Um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, so, so we do have a couple questions in here. I, yeah, we have a couple questions. I'll start with that one on pricing and I'm going to pull up the, um, the pricing for OpenAI here. And the reason why I want to do that is to kind of emphasize the, the difference in pricing that we've seen over time here. If I look at, um, I apologize for scrolling down, I was trying to find 3.5, but it looks like they've reorganized this recently. The input tokens for uh, GPT 3.5 cost $3 per 1 million input tokens and $6 per 1 million output tokens. Uh, GPT-4 here 
is 250 for input and one, uh, that's the batch, and $10 for output. So in some regards, it is slightly more on the output side. On the input, it is cheaper. That said, a million tokens is about the length of War and Peace. So if you are interested in getting started you don't have first you don't have to start with the top models you can easily start with something like gpt40 mini which is much cheaper and experiment around with that i think the primary expense is going to be the time of your individuals and what to kind of get started since i don't know the pricing of the time of your individuals i would take some of your top top people who are able to adapt quickly to different technologies get maybe get them some training just have to sell what we do but also find a use case which seems attainable in your company and have them try that out just do something um small scale and useful even if it doesn't get rolled out that will start to develop the process and that institutional memory, and you'll be able to kind of feel out what are the pitfalls, what are the um, things that you can do. And I would say if you scope that well enough and keep it small enough, you might be looking at a four-week four to three-month month effort to just kind of get started. Um, but kind of the mythical man month, I wouldn't go too big too soon. I'd, I would scale it to make sure that you're scaling well. Um, I know that was kind of a non-answer on pricing, so I'll just say um, budget $1,000. <laughs> uh, so a question here, I'm assuming most use of Gen AI will be via services provided by major players, i.e. Google, OpenAI, et cetera. What, factors, fa what will factor into a decision to self-host? Um, there are models which are open weights. Um, the big ones are Llama, which is put out by Meta. Um, and unless you are like TikTok, you can use it fine or the DoD. It, you can't use it for military purposes. Um, another one is Microsoft's V3, which is an incredibly small model. It's only 7 billion parameters. I would say if you have a bunch of GPUs available, if you have a good team that knows how to set up those GPUs to run models, and especially if you have a unique regulatory requirement to say keep data inside of certain networks, then it might be appropriate to self-host. Now, do keep in mind that some of the open weight models are, they're not going to be as robust as the API models because the APIs aren't just the models themselves. They have some structure around them. And so um, it can be, it, my preference is towards APIs first, and then I would fall back to self-hosted if there are particular reasons to. Um, at this point, I think it's probably most cost effective for the APIs for most companies. Um, how would I rate ChatGPT versus Claude versus Gemini? I I don't know. I use I'd use Gemini. One of those thing. It's preference log into something else and just do a whole separate thing doesn't really appeal to me. I hear really good things about Claude, though. Um, I'd say go with what you're comfortable with. And one of the things that I do like um, as an option, I believe both ChatGPT and Gem and I have this now, is the ability to create your custom system prompts and to provide input to say, hey, this is how I want you to interact with me. Um, do we have AI tools that measure ethics and responsibility? So yes, there is the Microsoft Responsible AI Toolkit, Toolbox. Uh, this is one of these tools um, that I will pull up here. Um, it is 
right here is kind of an example of it. This is a way to go through your model and kind of find out where there could be biases in it. Um, this is one example. Um, I took a, a class through this recently, and we took real-world data from the CDC, developed a model to predict the likelihood of diabetes, and then ran it through this. And without me doing anything to artificially bias the data, all the models that the students produced were, if, if you were over a certain age, it was like, yeah, you have diabetes. And if you were under a certain age, it was like, no, you don't have diabetes, just absolutely not. And so there was this bias based on age built into the data um, that was really, really fascinating to see. So we have tools like that. There are lots of specific metrics and specific benchmarks that you can do to test the ethics. Um, it really comes down to your use cases and what you want to allow and putting guardrails around it to say, hey, if there's a particular word, let's say you are Pepsi and you don't want your uh, model to every say, ever say Coca-Cola, you put a guardrail around there to just say, if it gives this output, say, I'm sorry, I can't help with that instead. So um, there are tools this is just one example. There's lots of even services which will help out with the ethics of it and filtering. Um, let me see, building your own solution versus using out of the box solutions like ChatGPT Teams or create custom GPTs for a ChatGPT-like solution. Um, It depends. It depends on the size of your company. Um, it depends on what sort of budget you're able to allocate towards it. I would say if you choose to use a SaaS solution, then I would make sure that you run that through a team first, a smaller team, because there are you know, not chat GPT, but there are Gen AI companies out there that are a little bit more hype than I know that we would like to admit sometimes that, you know, just kind of ride in the bubble. Um, so make sure that the tool works. But there can be so much time and effort which goes into development that unless there's a, a specific feature that you really want that is not being met by a out-of-the-box solution, the out-of-the-box is probably going to work pretty well. Um, there's a reason why everybody uses GitHub or GitLab. There's a reason why lots of people use Jira. It's because they work pretty well. And um, that said, there are going to be times when you do need to do Gen AI yourself, and those are typically going to be around specific use cases. Something like hey, we get emails coming in from 10 different vendors and they all have their own way of writing and we just need a way to rank the priority of them. And the Gen AI may be able to rank the priority really well. But that's something that is a particular use case and you're probably going to have to write some, some code or at least some prompting around that. Um... Okay, so any examples of low-hanging fruit to tackle first? I am sure that your company has people in it who just have entire lists of all things that they want to automate. And those automations, some of them are just rule-based, but some of them can be Gen AI. And this might be something like, if you are in customer service, not, yeah, a, if you had an out-of-the-box chatbot, that is probably low-hanging fruit. Another one might be an internal chatbot, which you were able to query, say, your SharePoint about. Um, hook it up, try it out, run it there. 
Um, another one, and I'm trying to make it generic now. There's lots particular to industries. Um, another one may be a bot that was able to answer questions about specific projects inside of Slack or something um, that just you typed, hey, at Gen AI, what's up with project, I don't know, so this security project, and it would just go be able to go retrieve something and give you a summary. Um, things like that where you're working with your data and especially internal because you have a lower risk level right there when it's internal instead of customer facing. I would say those are, are kind of the low hanging fruit and discrete automation tasks. Those could be very quick and very, very beneficial. A question from Marcus about how to ensure that companies' data exchange with GPT Gemini will not be processed or stored out of the country. Um, yes, so I don't know in particular about the open AI API and how doable that is. I do know that Azure's open AI allows you to select open AI services, which does connect to the open AI models, does allow you to select regions and do the processing in those regions. And if you have specific requirements around um, say FedRAMP levels, you can go to those specific FedRAMP levels for the Azure OpenAI services. So those are, I would go more to the cloud providers than straight to OpenAI. Um, and I think that GCP has an equivalent version, um, but you would definitely have to check out with GCP. So I would look at their regions and I would say generally, if you're in something like Azure or GCP, it's going to fall under their standard processes there. Um, there's a question about, is there any paid or free tool that allows to access ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude, Llama, or other LLMs on one interface and one payment plan? Yes, there is. And I do not remember the name of it off the top of my head. Um, Yeah, I, it's the name is escaping me right now. There are several different companies which do it, the model behind it. And that said, they're going to add a little overhead. But if you are just evaluating models to determine which one, it's definitely a way to go. Um, Justin asks, are there ethical frameworks to select from? I recently learned of a constitutional model, that's Anthropic's version. In addition, are there ways to not have a model hallucinate or provide vague information when it doesn't know? And how are mistakes removed from a model? Um, ethical frameworks, yes. Um, there's constitutional models, and a lot of these come down to fine-tuning how you are... Um, forcing the weights of the model to not produce harmful things. The, so there's lots of ways to do it, like in that training stage. If you're not training an LLM or not fine tuning an LLM, a lot of what you're going to do is on the input, output, and prompting. So making sure that you don't put bad inputs into it, bad outputs out of it, and that's sanitization just like you would for uh, like a chat interface. Um, and you can use an AI model to say, hey, is this safe to send to a customer? That's possible. That's very doable. And it's happens a lot. Um, and then inside the prompt itself, which goes to the model, um, you can give it instructions like, do not advocate for self-harm. Um, do not give health advice things like that. Um, another common statement is if you do not know or if if the answer is not supported or supportable in the information that you have, do not answer. Um, things like that. And with that um, question of AI hallucination, retrieval augmented generation is among the best ways that we have right now. 
And there are some tweaks to that and advanced methods to kind of get the model to reflect and then double check to make sure that you can verify the output with the input. Um, but it is not 100%. It will still get through, to which I would ask the question, do you assume your humans will have 100% accuracy? Um, because we don't. So yes, there are ways to get it to not hallucinate, but it's not going to be perfect. Um, yes, covered the AI ethics one. I don't think there are any more questions, but happy to stay on if there are any more. Well, Dan, I really enjoyed that. And um, I was on the edge of my seat, really. This is one of my favorite webinars. And I don't say that after every webinar. <laughs> yeah, and um, I will, just for those people who are in here, I'm going to drop my email in here. There are not two M's there. Feel free to reach out directly uh, with your AI questions. I'm happy to answer them. Um, I think I have two more questions. So was there anything else you wanted to say, Alex, before I finished up here with the question? Um, I was just going to put in the URL that I showed in the chat, yep. the WebH solution. So it's in there now, just showing the AI training. There's a map in there. And um, Dan's a great person to to get in touch with, to, um, you know, to help point you in the direction or set something up. Um, training models, can I speak towards the difference between RAG and training models? Yes. So, RAG versus training. I'm trying to think of a good example here. So, the tra training is going to update the weights. This is, this is just the kind of the technical answer. When you're training, you're going to update the numbers which make up the models. RAG is not going to update those numbers, those weights. Um, RAG is more like if you didn't study for an open book test and expected to just gain all the answers from the information that was in the open book. Um, when you are training, it is more like the studying and making sure that you are learning the content in the book. And what you'll see is a, something called fine tuning, or you're not just doing the full training from absolute scratch, but you're taking a good model and then fine tuning it on something like medicine or law or health. And what you'll often see like a fine tuning on that language to do better on health tasks. And even then you still use RAG on in addition to that to help the reliability even more. So they're not things that are an either or, they can be used together, they can be used separately. Um, but at a fundamental level, RAG gives information inside the prompt that the model can use and training is going to update the weights. You are not going to see that training data at an individual prompt level. Um, from Subas, I apologize for that name. Um, what's the best platform tool solution you recommend for creating a chatbot for all of a company's knowledge base? Um, you know, I'm not going to recommend one right off the top of my head. Let me see, though. Um, I'm going to pull this just to the side for now. You can take a look at my, my girls. Um, chat UI. I'm going to try to pull up this sheet. Uh, there are a lot of options out there for building your own. Here it is. This is something that I've been evaluating. This is just a big spreadsheet of the different solutions that are out there for giving a chat GPT like interface. And some of them are pretty well known like GPT for all. Um, this lets you run a model locally and kind of interact with it in that interface. I would say the ones that have been standing out to me are Chatbox and Libra Chat as kind of op options for these are UIs and maybe a little bit of tooling around them, and then you are able to hook them into your own systems. Um, 
so I think that's as far as I'm going to go with like a recommendation because there are just a lot of providers out there and I, I, I don't feel confident enough to say like, this is the one that I would go to. Um, trainings that I would recommend to get started more exposure, how to develop a use case, calculate the ROI. Yeah, so we have trainings for both business users, data scientists, developers, ML engineers, um, things like that. I would, what I've been kind of recommending to some of our clients is a, a tiered approach. So you have a couple of your real thought leaders in the business take some training to just dig into generative AI a couple days. And then from that, have them brainstorm, develop some use cases where they think generative AI can be applied in uh, your particular company and industry. And that's something that I'm happy to help in the brainstorming process with. Um, and then once you have that, bring in more of your developers, more of your data scientists for the generative AI training, and we can customize the examples that we provide specifically towards those use cases so that it is, we're, we're really tailoring it to you. Because ultimately, like, if you just want generic training, well, um, you, you're not going to come to us. You come to us because we are going to provide you something tailored for your use cases, for your industries, and for your company, um, and, and really high quality. So yeah, we, we have a whole bunch of classes, and I think that that link is in there. So any of those would be a great. Yeah, I can share that link of AI UI. Let me, let me pull that up now. This, I'm just going to share the Google Docs. I think that it is a public one, um, but if anyone like, um, yeah, anyone who has the link can access, no sign in required. Um, so you should be able to, let me just make sure I have the right one. You should be able to access that. Um, I did, uh, that is not mine for my credit. That was found online and someone had already done the work. So stand on the shoulders of giants. I think that's all the questions. Yeah, Sorry they were great that. questions. Great questions. Some of them I was wondering myself. Perfect. Um, okay, awesome. And, and I did get the question a couple of times, just in case you're still wondering. Yes, this session is being recorded and we'll send you the link to the video as soon as we have everything processed either today or tomorrow by the latest. Um, Yep. So you feel free to share it around and and watch it. Um, also, for attending this webinar, we're offering 25% off the public or private courses. And as I said before, Dan is a great resource and can help point you in the right direction for a, an upskilling program or just, you know, train for your team and customize it, which was kind of what makes us unique. Because as Dan said, we're, we can use your data, your use cases, and, you know, tailor it to exactly what you're looking for. Um, yeah, it was great. Yeah, thanks for all the nice, kind words for the presentation in the chat. We appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Oh, I have another one here. Blocking apps like ChatGPT in an enterprise to protect our data. Um, at my last company, I wrote the generative AI policy. Um, we were in the uh, government contracting realm, and I did say that you can't use it for anything business critical um, because of the risks associated with it. I would say if you are going to block it, provide an alternative because people are going to use it. People want to use it. And to simply kind of stifle that creativity, um, I, I would hate to just outright block it. Uh, that would be my, um, find a way to make it accessible and still protect the data. That would be my goal.
Um, how prevalent are you seeing products that have it embedded? Is there transparency seen there? Ooh. Um, I would say it is safe to assume that mm, I would I I would assume a company is using AI now. That is my general assumption. When I'm interacting with chat support, I do not assume that it is a rule-based system. I assume that it is generative AI until it says that I have a human. And if it has, says that I have a human, then I assume it is a human. Um, I have not yet met a case where I'm like, ah, this doesn't seem like a human. Um, so far, I've seen pretty good at transparency. I have not had a case where I've ex I've suspected that generative AI was being used and it wasn't transparent to me with one exception. I There was an article that was sent around recently. The article will remain nameless. Uh, generative AI, and I started reading through it and I went, I'm like 95% sure. And that, that kind of passing the LLM work off as your own, like, I, I like, there are times when I'm using the LLM to help me to, to get me from point A to point B faster. Um, but that's not a substitute for me getting from point A to point B. Um, because if I'm just relying upon the model entirely to say generate some text to uh, to write an email, that email might be really bad. Um, in general, I can write better than the AI right now, um, or at least I can write my intentions better. So uh, it was kind of long winded. <laughs> Um, we've had difficulty. We ban AI because of the data we process, but vendors seem to have it used in their products. Yeah, I would probably... I, I, I would love to have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation about your, your particular use cases, but my what I suspect is that that's something you're probably going to have to write into uh, terms and conditions and contracts to say like... Be, this data cannot be used in this way. Um, government health it, yeah. Um, I I did a research project on infant mortality rates with CDC data and got work data to the level that was de, I could de-anonymize it and actually identify people in it. And so had to go through that security level. And I, I think it's going to have to be in the terms and conditions um, so that you can hold people to account if they're misusing that data. That said, um, most companies are use, useful for data or used to data restrictions. Um, perhaps you could put some penalties around the misuse. That would be my, my thoughts, but I am hashtag not a lawyer. Well, I feel like if I say there are no more questions, there will be more questions. I'm, I continue to be happy to take them, <laughs> but no one needs to feel like they have to stay around. <laughs> no, this has been great. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else coming in. It looks like it. So maybe we will release everyone out into the world with all this new generative AI cutting through the hype business. So thank you so much. Thank you yep. so much, Dan. And thank you guys for, for all 28 of you who hung on <laughs> till the bitter end. Thank you all so much. Um, oh, there's Dave. Hey, Dave. <laughs> Trainer. Um, so, so happy to see so many people here, some people we know and a lot of new people. Anyway, we hope to see you on the next webinar. We'll be sending that out and we'll be sending out this recording as well. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday and we will see you next time. Ciao.